asked the panel to do before we got started um, was send me an image. Send me an image that reflects some of the things that we have to deal with in sports or just in general what you are seeing out there just to sort of get the conversation and to sort of show you what our day jobs do and what sort of as an image captures that feeling. So my first image is this. Um, all of us are in this room pushing the edge of the envelope. So Mr. Schopenheimer had a great quote, and he basically said, first, it's, ridic it's ridiculed, second, it's violently opposed, and then third, it's accepted in being self-evident. And that's what we all of us do in this room. We're trying to convince people to move off the general paradigm of what we look at sports and how we um, consume sports. So that was my sort of everyday mantra I give to my team to say, hey, people may think this is dumb and stupid, but this is something that I believe in and you should believe in, and, and the data is telling us to believe in that stuff. Second slide, Kelly, you can basically just sort of give the reason why you're. I think it's. Uh, introduce not, yourself to you, Kelly. Speak in the mic. Oh, hi. Kelly Moulton, uh, VP of North America for Never Know. We're a social television production platform for the producers of television. And it's a good time to be me right now because uh, everyone we meet with, uh, we end up doing something with. And people, uh, broadcasters, are very much willing to experiment. Uh, to end, this is very much a period of experimentation and, and innovation, so it's a very fun time uh, to be working with the uh, sports broadcast industry. Christine, big Brad Pitt fan. Yeah. I figured after I saw your old dude with white hair, I'd yes. go with it. Yes, <laughs> Brad Pitt. But no, seriously, um, Billy Bean, general manager of the A's, whether you've read the book Moneyball or seen Brad Pitt in the movie, you know, he believed that using the data would make them win. And it wasn't just about how pretty their girlfriend was or how good uh, their arm looked, but actually how often they got on base, how good is their arm. And so Sport Vision's motto is also changing the game. I'm the creative director at Sport Vision. No, I do not decide that the line is yellow, <laughs> but we are the creators of the yellow first and 10 line. But what we really do is we create digital records of the event. And from those digital records, we can tell you just exactly what type of pitch that was, how fast was it, and we can create entertaining experiences on second screen devices as well as um, on the TV broadcast. So, And that's one of the things we'll get into about data. Is data a friend or foe to sports, and how do we render it out onto uh, connected devices? Uh, Paul. Super Bowl is the most watched American television broadcast of the year, drawing over 100 million viewers. With almost 50 advertisers competing for viewers' attention, how do you stand out? We decided to game the system and add another screen. Over 50% of people go to a Super Bowl party for something other than watching the game. The Chevy Game Time app, a live second screen experience, gave them a legit reason to play with their phones for hours. The Game Time app was designed to hijack viewers' attention for the entire game. It gave people a reason to focus on our ads very closely and distracted them from watching our competitors' ads. We started by previewing our Super Bowl spots on the app, letting people know they could win cars from our commercials. On game day, we got people to answer trivia questions about our ads during commercial breaks. Since this could win you a Chevy, entire Super Bowl parties watched our ads very closely, first on TV, then again on the app. To make double sure people would be focused on our ads, we gave each app user a license plate. And if you spotted your plate in our commercials, you won the car. Which of course got app users to watch our ads again and again, all the while racking up our YouTube views. The app extended the game beyond TV by letting people interact with the broadcast in a totally new way. A team of 20 writers and technicians pushed real-time questions and polls to the app, letting players react to what they just saw on TV. And when we asked people to do something, they did, at times drawing 130,000 players to answer a question at the same time, more than double the attendance at the Super Bowl stadium. By the end of the game, we had over 21 million questions answered. The app had over 700,000 users, was the featured app in both iTunes and Android stores, and made it to the top 10 in the iTunes App Store, past Angry Birds and Facebook. Owning the Super Bowl? Now there's an app for that. That was nice. That was, was it? Well, one, thing, Go ahead. That? Well, one thing advertise, advertising agencies are good at is making themselves look really, really good. <laughs> um, 
Hi, I'm Paul Glomsky, the CEO of Detroit Labs. Uh, we're a technology company. We make premium apps for brands, advertising agencies, uh, and also potentially networks, by the way. If you're from a network and that freaked you out, we're happy to do that with you as well. A shameless plug. Um, this one, uh, th this, this app uh, in particular, was, uh, it was unique in two ways. One, one it, uh, it was for uh, uh, sort of non-sports fans, uh, pe people who didn't care about the game uh, and were just there for uh, the, the ads, the beer people uh, in the commercials. Um, and the second unique thing about it was it was a, a brand and an agency, um, Chevy and Goodby Silverstein partners came together mm -hmm. saying, uh, you know what, we just want to do something on our own here, completely separate uh, from, from, uh, from the other things that we're doing. Um, and uh, and it, was, uh, it, it showed that it was, uh, uh, this space is important enough to brands, this is you know, an example of a huge brand, um, that uh, you know, wanted to experiment with it and put some serious resources behind it. So um, again, uh, Paul Glomsky from Detroit Labs, we were the technology partner uh, that produced this. Uh, um, and uh, I'll leave the rest for, for questions. Yeah, let's say that because yeah. you know, we're all in here to create and innovate, but you actually had a sponsor that funded this innovation. And I'm curious to see where the future is. Do we see this more? where these sponsors and advertisers are coming in and going, all of us up here, I need that gold shiny object. Can you please create something that's n different? And it happens at Turner every day. And so we'll, we'll, we'll pause on that one. Uh, the next one is with Juan. 10, 9, 8, 7, 6, 5, 4, 3, 2, Melanie Collins here from our TCS studios. The best team in the country. I think this is a great story. Yeah! This is a team that I'd be afraid to play. Both teams are playing at a high level. Who wouldn't want to see this game? Back to the end zone. Touchdown. No. They have looked <laughs> terrible. They didn't play like they're capable of playing. How fun would this be? I love it. For the win. Yes! Welcome to SNM Sports and More. What else would it be? This is a team that has a chance to go deep into the tournament. Matt Barkley should be the all Pac-12 quarterback. Down the middle, got a touchdown, USA! I know he will be in the NBA. I love his game. They can really light it up from the three-point line. What were they thinking? Wow! The Bears strike back! Thanks so much for watching. We'll see you next time. Hi, so my, my name is Juan Delgado. I run uh, Americas for uh, Performant Digital Media Company. Uh, it's been around for about 10 years. Um, I think that the reason why I used this video instead of an image was just to really portray where I think, um, you know, the, the TV of tomorrow is where, you know, I used an example of a product we launched last year, which has gotten pretty big and, and massive around social media. but. You know, you could take a hundred other examples, YouTube putting a hundred million dollars towards content creation for the web, where you're actually able to create really uh, top quality TV level um, content with sports rights and be able to create a media property out of it without necessarily owning the live rights, which, you know, will always be a king on TV and, uh, and very difficult to compete with. So, anyway. Okay. And uh, our last one. This is me, and these are my friends. Back in the day, we never, ever missed a game. But then, life happened. I had kids, Jim moved away, and Tony, well now he's stuck watching chick flicks every weekend with his wife. We may be in different places, but Connect TV brings us all back together. We can talk scores, plays, even trash, all while watching the games live on TV. It's like we're in the same room again. Connect TV. Do more than watch. Download it free at 19actionnews.com slash connect TV. Thank you, uh, Pete. My name is Ian Aaron. I'm the founder of uh, Connect TV. We're a social network all focused on TV. In fact, today we just launched uh, with major broadcast uh, partnerships with Gannett, Cox, Bilo, Hearst, uh, Scripps, and others. Uh, in 85 uh, local markets across ABC, NBC, CBS, Fox, CW, my network TV affiliates. Uh, we built a platform today that actually 
Uh, it's a social network across over 400 different channels. Uh, it's a national network po local, uh, powered locally uh, with all of our broadcast uh, partners. These commercials, along with uh, many others, are being aired uh, at least two, three times a day on the networks. Um, we've taken a position that uh, people don't watch TV by downloading an app, changing a channel, downloading an app, changing a channel, and doing that over and over. That no matter what channel you go to, you're going to get an experience. We've got over 100 different metadata layers and content sources that we've integrated uh, to create a comprehensive uh, companion ex experience. Today we launch, uh, launched on iPad and works on browser. About 45 days, it'll be on all smartphones and Android devices. And uh, once again, you'll be hearing quite a bit about this. Great. OK, so I just wanted to kind of give you, keep the mic because you guys are going to pass it back and forth. So I'm going to go with a couple questions. I really want this to be interactive. So please, please, please raise your hand anytime and, and, and feel that you can ask any question you want. I want to, you know, and don't be embarrassed. All questions are great questions. Um, also, real quick, what I wanted to show you, which I thought was interesting because I had one more image I wanted to show you. So here's New York Times on Sunday. And I thought what was really interesting is they went with a navigation similar to a website. I don't know if any of you saw this on Sunday, but basically you highlight the picture and the stories below. And so I said to myself, oh my gosh, right? The way we design websites is now how newspapers are basically designing how they lay out pages. So I thought that was kind of interesting. Um, all right, so here's my first question. In the entertainment business, content is king. In the sports business, is data king? And I'll start with you. Christine, go ahead. I mean, it. I think the. At, for the start, the sport is king, right? And they, like, so you're saying for entertainment or sports? In well, I'm saying in general, you know, basically everybody says content is king, but it's sports data. Right, right. So the show is king, right? And what you're watching and the players, and 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 we do try to not disturb that, mm -hmm. right? Um, so as a designer, it's kind of a fun challenge for for me and for my team to figure out. What more can we give, whether that be on the first screen or the second screen? And, and, and obviously, at Sport Vision, we do believe that the data is king and that data is part of the content. So I always talk about it being data being beautiful, right? Like when you think about um, power in a game, in a video game, power is always a meter, right? You've never seen power as a list of numbers 30% for this and 50% for that. But you watch a baseball game and that's all you'll get. This is so and so's, this is Buster Posey's power and he's 80%. And in this ballpark, that would have been a home run this percentage of time. Why not power meters? Why not heat maps? Why not data that looks like it's part of the show and that looks more beautiful? And so we've been trying to do a lot more of that and also then take it to your device. On my device, do I need to see the NASCAR race? It's not video, it's not as good as, unless it's video, it's not as good as what's on TV. But Pocono has the sharpest angles of any racetrack, right? And what does it feel like and what is the experience of being on that angle? And our, you know, our user base, I always joke about this, our user base in sports is often, most sports, the target is 18 to 35 year old men <laughs> that we cover, football, basketball, and, and most of the people I work with are not 18 to 35 year old men, including myself. So <laughs> remembering who our user is and that they do want extra data on their device. And one of the biggest things they tell us is the most frustrating thing is when my driver is not covered, right? So could I virtually render those cars in 3D? Yes, because I know where those cars are, I have the data of where those cars are. I can virtually render them in 3D and you can see Dale Jr. whenever you want, whether he's in the lead or not. And he's usually not in the lead, right? So we do believe data is king, but data could be a car that I virtually rendered in 3D or a heat map that I'm showing over the strike zone, right? So yes, but I think data is content, so I don't kind of separate them. Kelly, when you guys design your interactive experiences, how do you track whether people are actually consuming that data, that they like that personalization, that they want? Well, we look at, uh, we work with ESPN. We're installed in their creative services group as their innovation toolkit, where we basically just create new concepts and show them to show producers. And when they like something, we take it on air. So we're going live with Sports Nation, Sports Center, Baseball Tonight in the, the coming um, 
months and CBS Sports, we're going live with uh, college and professional football. CBC, we're live with Hockey Night in Canada. Hockey's a bit big up there, as you might, uh, might know. There is no silver bullet answer to this question, and that's why I kind of did my happy face about innovation and experimentation. We look at a second screen experience as, as you rightfully said right from the start, as absolutely being a companion experience to the primary show sporting event going on. The fan is king, ultimately, we think, and we're, we're breaking up the second screen experience into four main quadrants. Stats, video, social, play along. And we're trying to mess around with features in each of those major buckets and see for, it, for different events, different fan segments, you know, different regions of the country, what's, what's working and best. In, and some people gravitate towards stats? Some That's right. Some people video. are just stats nerds, and they're always going to be mm -hmm. stats nerds. Some people get very much into trivia contests, predictive contests, and seeing if Redskins fans are, are more intelligent than Giants fans, or you know, that kind of stuff. Mm -hmm. Some people don't laugh. Yeah, it's an obvious answer, Giants, I know, yeah. But um, the, uh, and then with social, uh, going beyond just sort of the bread and butter of taking a tweet and putting it on air, uh, having, having actually really interesting uh, visualizations from that data, I think is going to be a big push. And we're working very closely. We have a native integration with our friends Chiron or sitting in the audience, VizRT, Harris, um, Orad and Ross, and so we really want to push the edge of things with uh, the creatives, the graphics people about how to uh, make this more visually interesting than just sort of a ticker experience of social. Um, and then video is huge, obviously. Mm. You know, I would, um, data historically has been focused on the power user, mm -hmm. and you know, whether it's the acquired package or the research, we've actually designed an interface uh, and incorporated data sets that really makes data available to the masses. And what we've really seen is really interesting that uh, your casual, no different than casual gamers, became a very big sector of the market. We think casual sports, sports fans uh, is an opportunity for enormous growth. The issue is you have to be ubiquitous. You set an expectation that if you're tuned to one channel and you're getting play-by-play -play sports stats, that if you tune to another game, you need to see the same thing. That's why we built a platform in which no matter what sport you tune, turn to, whether it's college, professional, basketball, football, baseball, you're going to get a common experience mm. across data. But then what also gets interesting is around what you can do to data to drive tune-in. You know, there's 30 games that go on on a weekend. Uh, what we've done with Twitter and our data sets to inform people based on their interests that certain things are happening on another channel. And it's important for you to tune in, or that's where your friends are and there's activity going on. So we've actually used the data not only to drive engagement, but also to drive uh, tune in. I, I think what's interesting on, on the Turner Sports side, with inside the NBA, we've done a lot of Twitter engagement inside the show. And the, the way to do that is you have to subtly you know, make sure that you can integrate tweets into the show. And it's been very effective. We follow celebrities. Uh, Jeremy Pippen was watching a game one night. We put his tweet up there. He commented about the broadcast. And I think taking that outside data and inserting into your presentations is very, very helpful. The point is, is how do you dilute? Do you do too many? If too many is uh, difficult to do, or do you try to do just a couple? And that's, that's the toughest part. Juan, I'm going to ask you, do you think all sports, um, you know, between Facebook and Twitter, uh, it will be omnipresent, omnipresent in all sports coverage. Like, you have to have it. Um, we, we actually just released a study this week, uh, which, anyway, it's a, it's a global study about uh, 20 different countries, um, given the footprint of our business. And, and one of the insights that we got from the study was around how sports fans are using social media. And the use of, of Facebook and Twitter mm -hmm. is obviously growing at a monumental pace. I think the, the growth from 2011, when we ran the study last time, to, to this year, um, it's about 35 percent. So you know, it, it, is in every, it is in every aspect of people's lives. Why not be it uh, when they're consuming sports, be it on the data side or on the video side and mixing both? through either apps or you know, stuff that their, peop their friends are watching, uh, not necessarily in the same room as them while the game's going on, be it the Super Bowl or just you know, a, a normal Yankees-Red Sox game. I think it was interesting this morning with Comcast seeing that they've in integrated Skype into 
their platform. A, I didn't even know that, by the way. I don't know if anybody else in this room knew that. But as a sports producer, wow, right? Could we figure out how to integrate displaced fans from all over the United States and get together and watch events through Comcast? That, that gets really, really exciting. Um, Paul, when you guys came up with the concept, um, I think bravo to you for sort of breaking the ice and taking a large event like the Super Bowl and scaling, uh, you know, 130,000 people. We're all, some of us in the technical business, and being able to handle that scale and then figuring out how, what the relationship is to that. Um, tell us how um, Chevy came along and how did that whole sort of experience get birthed and, um, you know, from start to finish. I think it would be helpful for people to understand you know, we all need to make money. So you did a fabulous job of sort of setting the bar for all of us to use as an example. So I'm curious how that story story went. Uh, sure. Uh, and just to follow on the last question, too, about Facebook and Twitter. So the, um, one interesting thing, uh, we, we have got a lot of good data because so many people use the Chevy Game, Game Time app. And um, uh, even though uh, there weren't any stats in there, we did, we did have some, uh, some comparisons of trivia versus other things. And if you answered trivia questions, you could win a car. They gave away 20 cars. And the interesting thing was, even with that high incentive, the most, uh, the most uh, visited portion of the app was the Twitter river. Mm -hmm. So even, even, though, even though there, were, there was no incentive whatsoever to, to go to the, twi to the, go to the twi Twitter river, um, that was the most, frequent, most frequently uh, visited part. And that's cu curious, curiosity, what people are talking about, what they're yeah, and and I would say that our curation of the Twitter River was average. I mean, it, it was uh, you know it was hashtag Chevy Game Time uh, mm -hmm. got got you in the Twitter River, and that you know that that was uh, fairly limiting, but still uh, it still was uh, where where uh, where people spent more time than anywhere else. Um, so to, to answer your question about uh, how how the how the whole thing uh, came about, I I think uh, so Chevy uh, and Goodby Silverstein Partners there ad agency, uh, super talented, creative people. Um, and Joel Lewanek, they're uh, the GM, uh, global chief marketing officer. Um, they, uh, they had kicked around a bunch of different ideas. Uh, I know that they talked to some other vendors, some, some who had uh, off-the-shelf solutions. Um, and and uh, at the end of it, they decided that they wanted to do something that was more of an experiment for themselves uh, and completely custom. So, so uh, they approached uh, Detroit Labs. We're a 12-month-old startup. Um, they took a risk to, to work with us, and it was a uh, phenomenal experience uh, for us. And we were really grateful uh, that they gave us the opportunity to work with them. Um, they, they came to us, and they said, hey, you know what? We, we want to do, we wanna do uh, this, this app that uh, you know, has people uh, increase our YouTube views, so you know, uh, competes with competes with uh, the primary screen, and uh, they asked us, uh, can, can you do this? Um, and oh, by the way, this was about two and a half months before the Super Bowl. So, so, uh, so we thought, hmm, largest media day of the year, um, you're actually giving away cars, so we can't screw this up, um, and they're probably, in this thing has to scale. So we said, sure, we can do it, <laughs> absolutely. Um, yeah. So, so, so the creative, uh, the creative process. I mean, in this case, it's a unique event because the content, um, the commercials are the content in part. I, I set for, you up a future slide up for you. Cool. Um, so, Goodby Silverstein Partners, uh, they led the creative development uh, along with um, the the client Chevy and Detroit Labs, and uh, we just, uh, you know, essentially uh, we we built it. So, here's some here's some stats of uh, of how of how it turned out. Um, we're uh, as a technology company, we're we're uh, we're very proud of the one here on the bottom right. Uh, there was uh, zero downtime. Um, uh, some some interesting some interesting stats around uh, the number of uh, people. You know the peak usage. Uh, we did a push notification to to answer a trivia question to win a car at one point, and uh, the the 128,000 people got in the app at the same time, um, and uh, we had. We had set it up so that so that uh, so it wouldn't break, and fortunately, it did not. Um, uh, average uh, usage for it was uh, three minutes per per user. So, you know, obviously, some people just went in there, answered uh, answered the questions to 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 win a car, and then other people um, spent a significant portion uh, of time of time in the app. 
Um, the breakdown for platforms, it was uh, a third Android. Uh, this was available, by the way, on iPhone, iPad, uh, and most Android devices. Um, and uh, the, the breakdown uh, for, this, for this audience was uh, a third Android and uh, two-thirds two uh, broken down between uh, iPhone and iPad. Um, any questions? Yeah, on, I was going to say, are there any questions about this? Uh, so we had, what's that? For the two-month period, which is pretty exciting. Our whole company, 15 developers. Um, we're, we're up to 20-some now, but uh, there were, there were uh, roughly 15 developers on this project, and the ad agency had uh, about the same number of people with us for that whole time. One of the questions I have for the panel is, do you feel like what we do as innovators, uh, we need sales to fund our innovation, or do we have budgets, which I don't think a lot of us do, to sort of innovate. And I, and I want to put that out to the whole crew because I think we're in that conundrum a little bit, and, and we are at Turner Sports for sure. Yeah, absolutely. Sales help, help uh, innovation. And I think uh, what's really important with this is that you have an on-air integration. Mm. Uh, one of our customers, won't let me say who he is, but uh, he's the head of uh, ad sales for the East Coast for a national network. Uh, basically says, I don't have social with its own line item this year. I'm still selling broadcast. Um, but I can take a major now uh, ad sale, $4 million ad sale for an event, and I'll, I'll ratchet up to five. I'll get five off the guy if I have some sort of on-air integration with a companion app experience. Mm -hmm. So what I'm doing now is I'm building up data like that throughout this year, and then next year I'll give social its own line item, and I'll have an idea of what that means in terms of actual products or services that we've bundled and proven, and we're gonna offer those up to sponsors for next year, and of course that funds uh, our innovation going forward. One other thing I, I just wanna say on that too is when, the, when it comes, this is great stuff, by the way, is when it comes to the, the companion app experiences, we have found a big difference again between when it's just sitting there, and let's say it's even promoted like as a URL, like you might promote mm -hmm. turnersports.com mm -hmm. versus a, a direct poll that you take one slice from one specific element from it and you say, vote now, and you actually have that on air, and you have it coming out to Facebook, and you have it coming out to second screen, you see exponentially higher engagement. Mm. Oh, you want to I was, I'll just take it from the other side and say for us it's more, you know, because we partner with the leagues and the <laughs> networks, we're thinking less at Sport Vision about the sales as much as about the fan sales, right? So less about the advertising and more about the fans. And, at bat, for example, is the top grossing. At bat is the digital application where you can see where the pitch locations are and see more data about the game. You can hear audio, and that's the largest grossing app in the App Store ever. So I think the fans' a bit willingness to pay $14.99 you know, for a download tells you how important that is as well. I think you, d you do need commitment uh, from the advertising side to mo fund most of the stuff that you do in sports, and it's, it's, it's mainly because of two things. You usually need to commit to rights up front, which are, you know, in the case of the broadcast side, uh, as you know, you guys probably heard from CBS and Turner committing $14 billion over the next 10 years. 11, uh, for 11 March billion Madness. dollars. Oh, 11, sorry. Just three short. Three, three, sh it, three short. Uh, three over. So, you know, it, it, you, you do need that commitment and that knowledge about um, as you were saying, you know, how much money can I actually make from this line item um, to be able to launch a product? But there is room for innovation and there's room for distribution. Facebook has proven a, a huge platform to get content out there and to not necessarily need to, you know, build your own silo property uh, um, like ESPN has, not, not, not to uh, sound detrimental to them, but, you know, they, they try to bring uh, eyeballs to them while people like us try to go out and find the users in, in all these networks and distribution platforms. How many people have uh, this case, right, where you have innovation and you're just waiting for it to get funded by a sales deal? How many people, raise your hand, I'm just curious. And then how many people just have a wonderful budget and you don't have to do bank sales or anything like that, you can just do your own thing? How many people have a budget? So there you go, that's interesting, okay. You know, we, we took an interesting approach as it relates to our broadcast partners, um, and to your point, we, it's a fully integrated promotional effort, both on screen, mm -hmm. uh, as it relates to the on-air elements that we've created. So a host that'll say, you know, see more on Connect TV or connect to real-time stats on Connect TV, to the commercials mm -hmm. that they're airing, to microsites integrated to their online. So we've created uh, this 
national footprint made up of these strong local promotional entities. And uh, if you take a look at what's going on in social in general, it's all around local, whether it's Groupon, whether it's Facebook places. So to, for us, building this national web of local was, was critical. And then what we've done is we've actually, on the innovation side, we've spent about six months recreating uh, native apps and controls all in web view. So our development cycles are three, four weeks mm -hmm. where we're turning around new releases, updates, getting information from our partners, from, uh, from viewers, and being able to iterate at a much faster pace and at a much lower cost without the kind of impact to the to the viewers yeah, viewers the, and upgrading the, the, and i'd be curious if people think of this we run into this sexiness about amps i can sell an app but html5 is is difficult even though for all of us it's easier to develop so i'm wondering if any of you have challenges with trying to do that where you're trying to convince the sales guys hey look it doesn't have to be you know chevy sponsors the app chevy can sponsor an html5 application that can run seamlessly across through the browser. Um, I'm curious if you guys get any of those issues. Uh, or are we not doing it right on the HTML5 to present to the advertiser that this is better than an app experience? Anyone want to? Go ahead. Just, just briefly, with one customer, uh, Canadian Broadcast Corporation actually just took the view no native apps. It's just going to be HTML5. And we're going to give advertisers one uh, side banner category as the, the sponsorship offer, and that's it. So not only do we sync up to the program and to the content inside the 400 channels, we also sync up to the ads. So we've created a platform, especially within our web view, where uh, the thousand or so ad sales team that's represented within the, the broadcast <laughs> partnership can actually go and sell complimentary ads without necessarily having to sell apps and being able to create that, uh, that companion engagement uh, ad all within the interface without having to go through the app process. How many teams in this room have built HTML5 apps as opposed to, and then how many are native apps? How many native app builders do we have in here? So it's kind of split. Just add to like we do apps in Unity, which work on both the Android and the iOS as yeah. one thing. So because if you're going to virtually render in 3D, we do a lot of um, we call it dot tracking. Like we can tell you where the players are at any given time, whether those are dots or actual physical players or cars. Um, if you render it in a platform like Unity, then it saves out to both devices, and we, we get around the um, having to dev uh, design native for for both. Uh, so I want to ask uh, another question I had, to ACR or to not ACR for sports? Um, Paul, I'm going to let you go with this one first because... Uh, I think there are better games on this panel. Hang on. Well, no, the only reason why I ask you is because you had to have a team that was basically syncing your app with what was going on in the telecast, and you're using manual people to do that as opposed to listening to the actual broadcast. I'm curious in sports what you think it should go towards, whether it's ACR or not ACR. Audio content recognition for people who don't know what that means. Yeah, so if for to do anything that whether it's with ACR or just automated in general, <laughs> as opposed to manual the way we did it, um, it it takes it takes a, a different level of investment and planning up front. So so uh, if if uh, in our case we were in the we were we were experimenting with something that that was that was. Uh, that was different, and and I know that uh, Chevy had Chevy had talked to some ACR uh, solution providers as well. At least that that was a rumor, um, and they they they, uh, they they opted for the manual process because it just wasn't um, for for that particular event. Uh, it didn't make it didn't it didn't make sense. We we didn't need to uh, we didn't need to invest in uh, integrating AC ACR because this was gonna it, it was a it was a large sort of um, Production effort anyway, so to to turn on some uh, trivia questions at different times during the game, or write them on the fly if something happened during the game, um, uh, th that wasn't something that really fit with ACR. So in our case, it really just wasn't a fit. 
but in my personal opinion for sports in general is is that is that there are a lot there are a lot more sort of sustainable things that you can do with ACR. Yeah, I mean we deal mostly uh, with live. Uh, when it comes to fingerprint versus watermark, we are really trying to let our customers uh, drive that uh, decision as mm -hmm. to what kind of flavor of ACR they will adopt. We are going to be doing this production where we'll do live uh, on the East Coast, and then we'll do basically live social to tape as it's rebroadcast um, back uh, to poor old Los Angeles. Um, but then also, too, as I think it was Anthony from Zbox once said, what about a manual check-in, too? I mean, it's also like, you know, what are you watching? Watch and, you know, let the customer also have the option just to tell us what they're watching. So uh, we've built a fairly extensive ACR network, and we're not only big believers of ACR, but big believers of uh, VCR and how we integrate other metadata like closed caption. And people talk about ACR very generically, but the reality for those of you who have implemented, there's a lot of idiosyncrasies, especially around TV. And that's where we built a lot of DNA. Uh, and there's even more idiosyncrasies around sports. Uh, as an example, when there's timeouts, when they, you know, when they do a, a toss to an interview, and how do you handle these things? So uh, not only do we, have we built IP in order to handle things specifically for sports, not just play-by-play, -play, but also how we do this and also DVR mode as well. Because if you take a look at the regional sports nets, which we interface to all of them in the top 40 markets, uh, they're constantly replaying games. And people, we want to give people a similar experience to what they were having uh, during real time as well. Sorry, I'm just trying to get your deck up here. Uh, there's a there's a UI slide. Okay. Uh, if you want to. It's a little. It's okay. Oh, you missed it. Right there. Oh, we could just no. Yeah, it was. If you. I thought we could have video. <laughs> well, you know, I was trying to make it where this wasn't a. And they told me they told me a few slides. So. I mean, really, it's a documentary right here. No, no. Don't worry about that. Okay. Um, so one of the things I want to, I posed to you guys was, uh, Apple TV. So our friends are down the street, right? Having these big developer conferences and, uh, do you think, you know, do we think the future of, of sports, uh, especially one with social integrating with TV as you watch sports will be where all this stuff ends up going? I think it does. And, and, and actually our, our study found that the, uh, the amount of people that are founding, that are using connected TVs to watch live sports is actually very low. It was five percent in the U.S. and I think it was a little bit bigger in in, in Europe. Um, so I think Apple TV, you know, might um, might come in with some different angles as to how you consume content. I don't think they're going to disrupt the TV industry and you know knock you guys out of the pedestal that you're in. Um, that will take a lot of time, money. Um, there was rumors about, uh, I don't know how, how much you guys are, are versed on, on uh, soccer, but the biggest soccer league is the English Premier League, and there was rumors about Apple bidding for the soccer Premier League rights outside of the UK, which were worth a couple billion dollars, just to you know, use it as a, as a key cornerstone to their, to their device. Uh, just because they've got 110 billion in the bank. But um, it, you know, ultimately, it, it, that conversation broke off, and anyway, we, we, we were involved at some point. And um, the, the, the point is that Apple will just try, to, in my view, will try to make um, accessible their platform, just like they've done for iOS and everything else, for guys like you know, Turner and CBS to, 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 ter to turn March Madness On Demand into a very rich user experience with live and VOD and data content on their, on their platform, but not necessarily you know, on the actual media. That's, that's not their business. You bring up something interesting. Do you think? Uh Apple and YouTube will be at the negotiation tables in the next rights negotiation for baseball and for NASCAR and for NFL when it comes back up. And do you think that's where we're all headed? I think YouTube will. They're already there uh, with niche sports. I, I think they'll grow bigger as, as they prove to the, the big mothership that you know they can actually make money out of live content. Um, Apple, I, I think their stance is we make beautiful products and people should be proud to have their content on our platform. So I, I do not think so. Um, 
again, any questions at all? Go ahead. I have no idea. <laughs> um, yeah, they. I mean, they. 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 Uh, they claim that uh, it. It. It was just. Uh, it was a cost benefit thing. Yeah. I don't. I don't think. I don't. I don't know if if it was a particular event that prompted it. I think it was strategic too, right? Everybody was at the upfronts in New York, and it suddenly just sort of showed up on everybody's radar. So that was kind of interesting as well. I know they pulled out a Super Bowl for next year too. So, I mean, they're, they're doing all kinds of stuff there. Yeah. And are you getting any other clients coming to you now that you have this great sort of, you know, experience that people want to use and use you guys in the future to create these experiences? Uh, we are getting some. Mm -hmm. um, so th there's, there's, def there's definitely inbound interest, uh, um, both, uh, both in the space where we could use the engine that we built for Chevy Game Time uh, either for brands uh, or for networks, um, as well as, uh, interestingly enough, uh, other ad dollars. So the, there's just, uh, right now, uh, apps are sexy, um, and, and a, lot of, a, lot of, uh, a lot of dollars that I think uh, were slated for um, you know, other, other medium are going toward apps. And, it's it's still a small percentage at this point, but um, it's definitely it's it's a focus for you know huge slow companies. Uh, you know, General Motors is. Uh, I mean, that, I don't know if you saw the picture that was up there um, for, for a while, but that was uh, that was their entire marketing organization at our office on Super Bowl Sunday, along with their ad agency. So this was you know top top of, top of their mind. Um, on Super Bowl Sunday. No pressure whatsoever on the Detroit Labs that you make sure that None. Works. Gosh. Yeah, none. Yeah. Um, so I'm going to finish it up with, uh, oh, go ahead. I'm sorry. Oh, um, you guys are all talking about the second screen. First of all, I see you tomorrow. But is anyone looking at the apps on the connected TV? Um, is that something that you're looking at? Is that a joint market for you guys? Or you're not, you know? uh, we've actually partnered with a couple of the manufacturers to launch apps with rights that we own on, on mainly just VOD and highlights. And I would say it's very, very early stages. And, and the audience there is, as I was saying before, you know, five people, 5% 5 of, the, of the consumers that we um, surveyed actually consume sports on a connected TV. So versus what we, uh, the, the amount of media inventory that we can deliver through our properties online and on web and on mobile, um, connected TV apps is just a very, very small percentage. That will, you know, tend to grow as same as the iPad has grown exponentially, and, and now it's a pretty big platform. But I, I think it's going to take at least 12 to 18 months before it actually is a relevant item in a media buy from an advertiser. I, I was going to add that. Not that we are doing it. I mean, DirecTV is doing it a little bit, but we should be doing it, right? Because fantasy sports huge, 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 huge business, both um, online, right? And you just can't easily see how your team is doing when you're watching on TV. So you have to have your connected device, you have to have your second screen because it's just not, it's just hard. Even with DirecTV, like you make your way through their UI and you ultimately see a few of your players, but the setup is so hard. So being able to seamlessly see how your team is doing would be fantastic and it's something that users have told us they want. but. You know, I'll, I would say then again. To also, there's other ways I think we're doing it wrong. I don't know how many people watch NASCAR, but and and I think it was exciting what they did last weekend with Pocono. They put so much Twitter, <laughs> TNT, <laughs> and Thank NASCAR you. together. Put yep. so much Twitter on the screen, but it was it was very produced, right? There was Kyle Busch's wife, and Miss Sprint Cup, and Joe Gibbs Racing. It wasn't Joe Average User and his thoughts because the leagues do need to be really careful about what content goes on screen and who that content is from. But why not, when Denny Hamlin almost ran out of gas, didn't it tweet to my account, Denny Hamlin's ready to run out of gas, <laughs> right? Like, why isn't it talking, why isn't the TV talking back to the places where I do my social activity? DL Jr. just went over 200 miles an hour, tell me that. And I think we just all think right now, Twitter, let's put it all up on the screen because it's what's really popular. But let's use Twitter how Twitter was meant to be as well. So 5 o'clock today, big debate. 
uh, downstairs in that great room where you'll have the people who are single screen and the people who are defending second screen. And I think it'll give us all really good notes that we can go back and justify to all our different businesses. No, 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 let's go two screen. No, 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 let's go one screen. So you should participate with that. I know we're almost done because I'm getting the nod. One more question. So I mean, I think you think you answered it. I think he, they design products. I don't know if they're going to get into that business. It's, I, I don't know. You know, I, you're right. They, could they? Sure, they got a lot of money and they could easily do it. In a five dollar sub rate, six dollar sub rate is a lot of money, and that's what keeps ESPN doing such a great job that they do. Um, I can tell you, you know, if you take a look at Xbox and if you take a look at Xbox and what started out as pilots and now has become a real business on uh, sports programming and content and take a look at the engagement and the video streams. You know, there's clearly something for Apple to, to go after there. So I'm gonna, gonna do a quick, uh, go ahead if you have one more comment. Go ahead, yeah, go ahead, yeah. Earlier, it seemed like when we were talking about sponsorship, you're kind of like, do we need that sponsorship to drive this kind of stuff? And it seemed like it was left with the impression there was just one gentleman who <laughs> raised his hand. I mean, absolutely, we do not need um, that to initiate this innovation. I mean, I haven't had to make an ROI case to do social television ever. Mm -hmm. In fact, I don't think it's going to be called social television pretty soon. That's just going to be a redundant phrase. I mean, obviously, rights are foremost. I mean, if you're a sports television producer, you've got to have the rights. But right after that, if you don't have your social television platform in place or your, your strategy in place, you're going to lose your fans. You're going to lose your, your customers. And so it's, it's, it's essentially coming out of the, the TV production budgets. And then sponsorship and advertising are obviously the, the gravy afterwards. Yeah? Any other questions? So I'm going to just do a tough one at the end here. So of the companies that are, are, uh, that are out there that are doing this, what companies are you looking at that you're saying like, ah, you know, and it may be Apple, but I'm just curious just down the row, what companies you're looking at right now that are doing some really amazing stuff that you're keeping an eye on to see how they could be integrated into the stuff that you're doing. And it could be as basic as a, so you can flow it down. But it could be the big obvious ones. It could be the big obvious ones. I'm just curious, you know, there's a lot of people out here that have to go back to their offices around the country and sort of stimulate what we're trying to do. You know, convince people from my first slide that, you know, this is all coming and you have to figure it out. And what companies can we use as an example or that you're thinking about that could help everybody in this room do that? Uh, I'm going to go with an easy one, which is one of the leagues. I don't know how many people you know that uh, MLB actually have a separate digital arm called MLB Advanced Media. Mm -hmm. And they're not a startup by any means. They're, they're now a pretty sizable business. But they always um, pride themselves in, you know, to your previous question about that we need to fund some of this stuff to actually get it done. Um, the guy who runs that business doesn't care. He just goes out and does great products, reason why they always you know, were the first sports app to launch with iPad. And those guys are always pushing the limit in terms of what they can do uh, because maybe they're disaffiliated with, with the league and the broadcast rights. They can, they can sort of push the envelope. So, so I always MLB look at them. is what you're saying, advanced yeah. media. OK. So uh, the, well, we work with individual broadcast groups. They actually came together in a consortium called Pearl. They have two initiatives. One is mobile DTV. So dealing with all of the retrans, um, they're delivering a nationwide platform in partnership also with NBC Corporate and, and Fox. And they've basically taken this uh, group of broadcasters, brought it together to create Pearl. Pearl is also, their other initiative is Connect TV. And I think it's considering that 45% of all viewing experience happens on the broadcast networks. They've got the top programming you know, uh, pretty much period, in, including uh, quite a bit of sports. Uh, I think it was really smart for them to come together and, you know, start looking how they're going to attack, you know, digital both in over there and in second screen. Okay. Uh, 
I'll, I'll take the design route and say, like, from a design perspective, we're looking a lot at like e what EA Sports can do for games, and saying how can we make the sports experiences that are on devices mm. be as elegant as that, even though it's live data stream. It's, I always hear the excuse, it's live data, it's streaming, it can't be as good as EA Sports. Well, what if it could be? What if our apps could feel like games? It would really change it would change the game. It would really change the way uh, people experience sports on their mobile phones. He's actually sitting in the audience, uh, Yaren uh, from MTV3 Finland, who's the head of consumer interaction there, who will be speaking at two in the workshop room. Uh, in Europe, MTV3 Finland is the best regarded broadcaster in terms of innovation, in terms of interactive and social, hands down, and from monetizing it. Uh, they make gobs of money, obscene amounts of money uh, from it. <laughs> And actually, this whole topic of like loyalty and points and the long tail, which we didn't even get into today, they're already yeah. well down the path there. So he has a lot of interesting things to say it too. So I'll give the I'll give the non-answer. Uh, I I don't think that there's any real clear uh, early lead in the race because the race hasn't been defined. I think that there are just so so many so many different so many different uh, um, ways to approach the space right now. And and as a and as a custom. Uh, development shop. I see, um, I see just so many, so many different directions of so many different potential clients. Um, wh whether whether you're talking about whether you're talking about platforms or entire different hardware devices, um, whether you're talking about uh, defining engaging with audiences uh, as social or whatever else you whatever else you want to call it. Um, I just think r right now. Uh, and, and oh, by the way, all the all the venture uh, funds who are who are backing all the startups that are supposedly leaders in this space, all of them say that that it's completely overcrowded, overfunded, and that a very very small percentage of them are gonna are gonna make it. So, uh, I think time will tell. But you know, given how fast things are moving, maybe it won't be much time. Okay. So thanks very much for coming. We appreciate it, and uh, have a great lunch. <laughs>